Hi, Jamie. Hello, Sam. How are Good you? Good new, you very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed right. for late in Melbourne. And I know it's nine o'clock at night. I've just had a cup of coffee, oh, well. which was probably a bad very idea. Bad, yeah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to our webinar tonight um, on employer-sponsored visas. My name's Sam, and this is my colleague, Jamie, uh, and we are from Sable International. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending um, today. Uh, today, we hope to um, provide you some information, to enlighten you, to educate you, um, to help you to try and find that all-elusive sponsor in Australia. Um, there's a chat box uh, functionality in this webinar and we're happy for you to use the chat box. Um, only Jamie and I can see what you put in the chat box, so no one else who is logged in can see what you're writing in the chat box. Um, we welcome your questions throughout the webinar. We're not going to do specific in detail questions about your specific circumstances. It would be inappropriate to do that, but we're happy to do generic questions that might be appropriate to a lot of people. So feel free as we go, if you have a question to put in the chat box and if we can answer it, then we will try and answer it on the spot. Otherwise, we might do a little bit of Q&A at the end also. Um, Given that you have the functionality of the chat box, we'll ask people to use the chat box now and maybe um, just put into the chat box where you are, what city you're in, what country you're in, um, whereabouts you are located here and now. I'm in Melbourne, Australia, um, and Jamie is in South Africa, Cape Town. Sunny Cape Town. Um, sunny Cape Town. Sunny day today in Cape Town, is it, it Jamie? It is. It's very, very nice. I'm ready for summer. Winter dragged on a little bit too long this year. Yeah, I feel the same way here in Melbourne. Okay, people so from all over. that's great. Yeah, people from all Durban, over. Dobo, Botswana, Mshlanga, Nigeria, Sim, Durban again. Oh, that's great. It's nice to see people from all over. George, Tunisia. Oh, wow. Tunisia. That's quite cool. Okay, well, we're getting exotic now. There we go. Someone <laughs> tuning in from Tunisia. That's great. Awesome. All right, that's great. Thank you everyone for participating. And like I say, feel free to chime in throughout the webinar. Um, who are we? Who is Sable? Um, so my name's Sam. I'm a registered migration agent. I have worked for this particular business for close to 17 years now. Um, I'm located in our Melbourne office. Um, I manage this office. I've been a registered migration agent for some, some time now. I've worked in the industry for a long time. Um, as a business, we assist people um, to relocate overseas, uh, not just from South Africa, but from all around the world, and not just to the UK, and uh, not just to Australia, but other locations like the UK. We're one of uh, the world's largest UK immigration providers. Um, we're also a foreign exchange business, a tax business. Um, we're an accounting business. We do a lot of different things. We're a group of companies uh, that employ people in Australia in the United Kingdom and in South Africa. Um, Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely, so I'm a migration consultant um, based in our Cape Town offices. Um, I work with our team in Australia, so with Sam's team and our team here in South Africa. Um, and predominantly at the moment, I work across a lot of employer-sponsored visa applications. So today's topics are definitely in my wheelhouse. And if you've got any questions afterwards, please get in touch with me. Our contact details will be at the end and I'm happy to speak with all of you. Jamie's your best local contact in South Africa and on that side of the world to speak to as your first port of contact when talking about employer-sponsored visas. Um, all right, so today's agenda, we're going to talk about employer-sponsored visas. What are they? What types of employer-sponsored visas are available? What's the process of applying for an employer-sponsored visa? Um, what's the most common employer-sponsored visa? And how do I become a permanent resident through employer-sponsored visas? We've got a lot to get through. We aim to do this webinar in 40 minutes. Um, so we've got 35 minutes to go. Let's get into it. So what are they? So an employer-sponsored visa. So the Australian visa system allows businesses and other organisations in Australia to employ foreign citizens and obtain working visas for them. You cannot apply for an employer-sponsored visa without first having an employer in Australia who has agreed to sponsor you. Jamie, is that a question that you get often? Get it quite often, absolutely. It seems quite straight, quite straightforward to us because we do it every day. Uh, but to a lot of people, um, 
to those who don't understand the system, they don't understand entirely that they can't start this process and apply for an employer sponsored visa until they've found the employer. The term sponsor and nominator is used interchangeably when talking about these types of visas. And generally, it means that the employer is supporting your visa application in some regards. The types of support that they will offer will differ based on the type of visa that you're applying for. Subclasses. Okay, so in Australia, all of our visas are referred to as subclasses and every subclass has a numerical value attached to it. So the 400, the 407, the 408, this is the language that we talk in the visa and immigration system in Australia. Get used to talking about subclasses and understand which subclass it is that you're applying for. So for example, we're doing a lot of applications for 400s out of South Africa at the moment. And the 400 is a temporary work short stay specialist visa. Typically this visa can be granted for anywhere between three or six months, but it's for non ongoing projects. So a lot of our employers here in Australia are using skills from overseas to come into Australia and quickly fix a skill shortage that they have in their business. The 400 is granted quickly. We had one granted today that was lodged earlier this week. So literally it can be granted within days or weeks. Um, and like I say, it's used by employers to get people in quickly to fill a job which they can't fill from here within Australia and is for a short immediate project. Jamie, are you seeing a lot of 400s out of South Africa at the Definitely moment? Definitely quite a few. I mean, like you say, um, it's even in the name, it's a short stay specialist visa. So a lot of employers in Australia, they have projects, think construction. They've got a six month construction project that they need engineers on or trades workers, things like that. So this works quite well in that instance. Yeah, for sure. We're building a lot of stuff here in Australia at the moment, a lot of roads, rail, uh, a lot of infrastructure and we simply don't have the people here to do it that we need. So that's the 400. Um, the 407 is quite common as well. It's a training visa. It's used by employers uh, to either bring people to Australia or retain here pe people here in Australia um, who perhaps don't necessarily have the level of skill to apply for a different type of visa, um, but have a foundation of knowledge in a particular op occupation that they wish to then upskill that person in. There are sporting visas, the 408 sporting visa. Um, I think we have a number of your rugby players here in Australia on the 408 at the moment, uh, trying to teach us guys how to play decent rugby. It's not working, but we'll keep trying. Um, the 482 visa, the temporary skill shortage visa. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this particular visa today. Um, and it's probably one of the most common visas that people come into Australia on. The 494 regional sponsored visa is a relatively new visa and it's been used to great effect um, by employers in regional areas to source skills from overseas that they can't find in Australia. And then finally, we're going to talk about the 186, which is probably what everyone is aiming for and trying to qualify for because it is a permanent visa. So these are just some of the subclasses. These are not all of the subclasses of employer sponsored visas. It's just an example of a number of different uh, employer sponsored visas that you might be offered to come to live and work here in Australia for an employer. So what's the process of applying for an employer sponsored visa? Where do you start? So most applications for employer sponsored visas follow a process of sponsorship license, nomination, and then visa application. It needs to be done in that order in order to apply for each application after the other application has already been submitted. So a sponsorship license is granted to an employer here in Australia. Um, the employer needs to demonstrate that they are lawfully operating a business here in Australia. Um, the sponsor is typically granted a license for a period of five years. So they apply once for the license um, and as long as they adhere to the rules, then the license is granted for five years and they can continue to sponsor people under that license. Um, once you have a license, you can then nominate um, an occupation that you wish to sponsor within your business. Um, so the nomination is all about the position. Uh, it's about the job description. Uh, it's about the particular occupation that you're choosing to nominate. Um, you, the business needs to demonstrate that there's a genuine need in their business to employ that particular person. There is no use, for example, 
um, for a physiotherapist office to try and employ a plumber in their office okay so it's got to be genuine and in line with the type of business that they're operating here in Australia once the nomination has been submitted um, you the visa applicant can then submit a visa application um, you need to demonstrate that you've got suitable skills the qualifications and experience to carry out the job now depending on the type of visa you're applying for you might need a skills assessment you might need qualifications employment references and you'll probably need medical checks police checks you'll definitely need passports and other ID documents um, Jamie does this process that we've talked about just now um, confuse people when you first talk absolutely to them? they're very overwhelmed because I mean it's it's three different applications like you said depending on the visa this the requirements can change a little bit so it can all feel a little bit daunting not just to the visa applicant but to the employer as well so you might get a job offer and the employer is telling you to sort out a visa because they've got no idea where to start and they're completely terrified of this process they've never done it before um, and that's really when you need to get in touch with a company like us um, or just a registered migration agent in general um, we can speak with the employer from our Melbourne office or we can speak with you as well like I said I'm based in Cape Town so I think I'm on a lot of your time zones It'd probably be easiest it's important it's important that the employer understand the process because often the employer hasn't done it before um, and they're confused a little bit scared perhaps by the process itself so that's the process in a nutshell we're happy to speak to employers here in Australia about the process and how we can assist them in the application process so what's the most common employer sponsor visa that I could be sponsored on um, well without a doubt the 482 visa is the most commonly used uh, subclass of visa that employers here in Australia use to bring in uh, citizens from overseas to fill gaps in our skills and um, in the labor market here in Australia so it's referred to as the 482 the TSS visa or the temporary skills shortage visa it has the word temporary in the name of the visa because it is it is a temporary visa you are a temporary resident when you come into Australia on this particular visa the visa can be granted for anywhere between one to four years and requires that you only work for the employer who has nominated you so you can switch employers um, whilst you're here in Australia, but only if the new employer has applied um, and been approved to switch sponsorships from your old employer. Um, and only then can you start employment with the new employer. Um, like I said, you're a temporary resident on this particular visa and you need to understand when you bring your family members or, or when you're coming as, an, as a single individual person that you're a temporary resident and that temporary residents are not afforded all the benefits um, that Australian citizens are afforded. So for example, medical um, benefits uh, are not afforded to people on temporary visas like the 482 visa. And in fact, if you come on a 482 visa, you need to fund your own private health insurance. And it's really important that people understand these particular conditions. Absolutely. Jamie, what's a common question you get when um, when you're talking to people about the 482 visa? I think a lot of people are a little bit nervous about being locked into an employer and really relying on this employer to keep them in the business um, they worry about what if they get fired or retrenched and things like that um, and yes that's yeah. a valid concern um, if that were to happen you would have 60 days to find a new employer that can take over your sponsorship um, and then you can go on to work with that new employer once that's all been approved so it I understand it can be a little bit of a short time frame but you'd already be unsure and it is definitely possible Another question I get a lot is whether or not my family members can come with me on the 482 visa. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yes, definitely your family members can come. So anyone who is a member of the family unit, so um, your spouse, your partner and your um, children, um, yes, they can come to, with you to Australia on the 482 visa. Um, your partner has uh, full and unrestricted work rights. So a spouse can go and work for whomever they choose once they're onshore. They are not restricted. They don't have that limitation on their work rights like the main applicant does. Um, your children are entitled to come and to attend our, our state schools as well. Schooling is not necessarily free. It depends in which state of Australia you're in and you need to research uh, those topics on schooling and costs of schooling um, before you commit to a 482 visa. 
But the 482 visa is the most common visa that uh, most people would, will come to Australia on. And for some people, it does provide a pathway to permanent residency as well. Um, and that's what we can talk about now. So how do I become a permanent resident through an employer sponsored visa? So this particular pathway is referred to as the 186 visa um, and the temporary residence transition scheme or TRT. So the TRT scheme says that you need to be under the age of 45 when you apply to transition, um, unless you have an exemption as a high income earner. Um, you need to have worked in an occupation on the medium to long-term list, and you need to have worked for your sponsoring employer here in Australia for three years whilst holding the 482. Um, so this is an important concept and it touches on what we spoke about just earlier and that is about switching employers. So yes, you can come to Australia on a 482 visa and you can switch employers at some point in time, um, but the clock starts again. So for most people, they should be aiming to come to Australia and work for an employer for three years. And at the end of that three years, they then transition from the 482 to the 186 visa through the TRT scheme. Now, if you're two years into a visa and you're thinking about changing employers, just remember that you're going to start all over again. So you need to then do another three years with your new employer in, or, in order then to qualify for TRT. You need to be cognizant of your age. So for example, if you're 42 years old and you're switching employers, will you have enough time to then work for three years for the new employer so you can then qualify for TRT at the age of 45 or under 45. You cannot be uh, 45 or older when applying for TRT unless you have an exemption. So these are important considerations. Um, you need to be nominated by the employer that you currently work for in a continuous in full-time role, and you need to pass medical character and English language checks. Jamie, is this a question that people bring up when you speak to them before they've applied for a 482? Are they aware of the 186 transitionary scheme? They're maybe not aware of the specific visa subclass, but they definitely know that what they want is permanent residency. And so I always go back to say it's it's important that you make that clear to the employer and that from the get-go, while it's very exciting to get a job offer and to you know have an employer say, look, we want you to come through on a 482, for example, it's important that you understand what is your pathway. How do you make sure that you've, you've got that stepping stone to getting your 186 TRT in the future so that you can stick with the requirements and make sure that you've actually got that option in the future. Yeah, and what we need to stress here is that the 482 visa can be applied for in a number of different occupations, but the skilled occupation list has been split into two separate lists. That is the short-term list and the medium to long-term list. Now, the short-term list is a lot longer than the medium to long-term list. But if you get sponsored on a short-term list to come into Australia on a 482 visa, generally speaking, you don't have a pathway to permanent residency through the TRT. So you need to think about what your pathway is if you do accept a job offer for 482 whilst on a short-term occupation. If you're on the medium to long-term list, then happy days. Chances are you're going to have a pathway after three years of working for your employer. Alrighty, 186 diary entry. So it's the same visa, it's the same subclass of visa, um, has the same costs, um, but there's some fundamental differences between direct entry and the TRT. So direct entry, still you have to be under the age of 45 at the time that you're making your application. There is an exemption for some occupations, like for example, university lecturer, uh, but generally speaking, most people have to be under the age of 45. Um, at the time you submit your visa application for direct entry, uh, you need to have a positive skills assessment in your nominated occupation. Um, and that's an important concept that everyone needs to understand. Also, not everyone whilst working in that occupation will be eligible to pass a skills assessment in that occupation. Um, again, you need to be on the medium to long-term list and you need to have at least three years of post-qualified work experience in your nominated occupation in order to qualify for direct entry. Um, and common to all permanent visas, you need to pass the medical, the character checks, and the English language checks. Does DE come up much when you speak to clients, Jamie? For clients that have done a little bit of their own research, um, everybody wants the 186 DE. I mean, it's permanent residency from day one. Um, everybody would want that. Um, but I think it's important yep. to understand that um, employers can be a little bit hesitant to offer that option. Um, with 186D, once your visa is approved and you're a permanent resident, 
you're not really in any way tied to the employer. So you could technically walk away and that's a massive risk for the employer. Um, so more yeah. so if I see somebody actually proceeding with 186D, it's normally because they work for a company that has an office in Australia, for example, maybe they're working in the UK or yep. South Africa and the Aussie office wants yep. them and they are looking to transfer yep. them through. Then 186D is, it's a great option. They've built that trust. They know that the employee is going to stay with them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah, it's kind of reserved for, like Jamie says, for employees who already work for the employer um, or perhaps have worked for the employer previously and are returning to that employer um, or highly skilled people who um, whose skills are in really high demand and they can use those skills as a bargaining chip more or less when they're negotiating their way into a work contract. And, and, and I've seen it happen whereby They've negotiated their way into a 186 direct entry application um, without having previously worked with the employer because their skills are so highly in demand and they've they've worked you know in some very reputable companies in some high level positions and the employer in Australia just really wants them and again we, we have a lack of shortage we have a shortage of skills here in Australia at the moment and some employers are willing to put a 186 DE offer on the table in order to secure. Um, those skills. Absolutely. That said, don't be um, disenfranchised or don't be saddened by the fact if you talk to an employer and they say, no, 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 we're not going to do 186D for you straight up. It's, it's relatively uncommon in, in those situations. And this visa, the 494 visa, the skilled employer sponsored regional visa, temporary to permanent. This visa is relatively new um, and the bonus of this particular application and this particular visa is that the skills list that you have to choose from is uh, a lot larger than what the uh, 186DE or TRT scheme have available. So you can be sponsored on a short term stream visa uh, occupation that is and still be able to qualify for a 494. So common to all these types of um, permanent visas is that you've got to be under the age of 45 at the time of application. Uh, you may work in a short term occupation. Your employer must be located in regional Australia. Tell me, Jamie, when you think of regional Australia, what comes to mind? I mean, first thing you think the outback, you think tumbleweeds, it's just dusty deserts, <laughs> dry, hot. <laughs> kangaroos. kangaroos. Trying to chase me. No, <laughs> that's not what it is. Yeah. It's, it's a big, big misconception when it comes to the visa and immigration system that a regional area is in the outback, that it is the great sandy desert um, and that you are far, far away from any metropolitan area. The truth is, is that just about everywhere outside of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane are considered to be regional. The whole state of South Australia is considered to be regional. The whole state of Western Australia is considered to be regional. So you could be living in Perth or Adelaide and, and still be nominated on a 494 visa. Um, so yes, there's, don't think when you hear regional people, don't be, don't run away um, scared thinking that you're going to be attacked by spiders and snakes in the outback when uh, living in Australia on a 494 visa. You could be, and you could still be in like, you know, a fairly metropolitan area. We have snakes and spiders Didn't everywhere. Did you grow up in regional um, areas, Sam? I you did. I did, okay. Jamie. Thank you. For... <laughs> yeah, look at me. I turned out okay. That's right. I saw a lot of spiders and a lot of snakes. Um, so, yeah, regional. There's some beautiful, lovely regional areas in Australia um, that uh, offer a really good lifestyle and way of life, um, a really good balance between work life uh, and home life. You don't have to put up with the commuting uh, through inner city and, and such. So consider this to be a really good option. Um, so back to the criteria, um, you need to have at least three years of post-qualified work experience. And again, you need to pass medicals, characters and English language checks. Um, and then this final point is a really, really important point. So the 494 is a temporary visa. It's actually referred to as a provisional visa, not a temporary visa. And they use the word provisional because you have a definite pathway to permanent residency and you have that pathway through subclass 191. Um, and basically the visa has been designed to say that as long as you live and work in the regional area 
for your sponsoring employer for a minimum period of three years, then you can apply for your permanent residency independently of your employer through subclass 191. So unlike the 186TRT and unlike the 186DE, whereby those applications are dependent on your employer nominating you, um, you have this definite pathway to permanent residency from the 494 via the 191. So it gives people some confidence that come to Australia, live and work here for three years, do your time, and you will get permanent residency. Is this a visa that you have many conversations about, Jamie, or is it um, not widely known um, with your uh, colleagues in South Africa? It's not widely known, but I think once you mention it as an option and people realise the pretty much sure and definite pathway to permanent residency is very, very attractive. Um, I think um, when you're moving to a new country, you want some level of certainty that you'll be able to make a permanent relocation. So the 494, I think, gives you that security. Um, and sure. and definitely, I mean, it's it's yes, you have to apply when you're under 45, but you don't have to be under 45 when you apply for your 191, which is great. So, mm. you know, a, a little cohort of people in their early 40s, it opens up an opportunity for them to come to Australia and get their permanent residency, which is great. No, for sure. I see we have a, a question in the chat box um, asking, uh, what sponsorship options do we advise for those people who are 45 years and older? I should mention that the 482 visa does not have an upper age limit. So you could be sponsored on a 482 visa at any age, um, as long as you've got the required skills, experience, um, relevant qualifications, then sure, come to Australia on a 482 visa, but just understand your limitations and uh, understand what your chances are as far as being able to transition from the 482 visa to a permanent visa, if at all possible. It might not be possible depending on you and your occupation um, and uh, who might be looking to sponsor you. Um, so for some people, and we see it, we recently had a client come to Australia um, who is over the age of 45, um, who's gonna take up employment here in Australia um, and understands that he may well only be here for two to four years and, and then go home to South Africa. He still wanted the experience. Um, he still wanted to uh, try Australia um, to work in a new country, um, perhaps make some money and then take it home to South Africa. Yeah. See, another question as well. Um, a lot of people are concerned about passing English requirements um, and they want to know if those sorts ah. of requirements can be waived. I mean, English requirements do apply across the board to these types of visas. The way you go about meeting English, um, it would depend on the visa. Sometimes, yes, you do have to do an English test. Sometimes it's holding an eligible passport. Sometimes it's proving that you've studied in English. So it's unfortunately not a question that we can say yes or no. Um, probably be best that we assess your individual circumstances and then take it from there. Yeah, um, sitting the English language test is probably the part of some applications which gives some of our clients uh, their most greatest concern. Yeah. Um, no one likes doing a test and it's probably been a long time since most of us has had to sit exams or tests. Um, and yeah, people do get quite nervous about the English language test. Um, when we're talking about the 482 visa, for example, if you hold an eligible passport, for example, if you have a British passport, then um, you know, you're exempt from English language, but um, not everyone's uh, lucky enough to have uh, a British passport. Um, the English language criteria is for a 482 visa um, is um, not a very, very high bar um, as compared to some other subclasses of visas. Someone's got a, got a, got a question there regards to IELTS. Do you have to do general or academic um, for any of these particular employer sponsored visas? You could do general. Oh, okay. So moving on, how do you find an employer to sponsor you? This is have to be the most common oh, question yeah. you get asked, Jamie. Is that Always right? day in, day out. It's the question, how do I find one? Let's see if we can yeah. tackle that. Yeah, let's see if we can tackle that. Um, we've got a few ideas and it might not be anything you've heard before, but um, it's worth touching on again. So how do you find a sponsor? Um, contact employers here in Australia, contact recruiters, um, 
use your family and friends, use associates, use people you've worked for previously, work your contacts is our best advice. People who we see who are successful in finding in sponsors to employ them here in Australia have usually worked every contact they have. Um, and normally or commonly, um, they've found that employer um, through someone they know not what they know. Um, that said, depending on your occupation, uh, you might find that um, it, it's not so difficult for you. Um, be prepared is my next um, set of advice, uh, which I would like everyone to um, consider. Um, you need to understand the process. You need to have your documents ready. If you need a skills assessment for that particular occupation, then you need to have it approved already by the time you find that sponsor. I'll give you an example. So for a welder in South Africa to be sponsored on a 482 visa, it's mandatory for you to have a positive skills assessment at the time that you make your visa application. So if you are a welder in South Africa and you find an employee here in Australia and they are willing to sponsor you, then my suggestion would be that you have that skills assessment in hand at the time that you go and find the employer because a skills assessment could take six months to process. So it's no good finding the employer who has an immediate skills shortage um, and them being really eager on you, but you not being able to fulfill the skill requirement at that time because your documents are not in order. So get educated on what the requirements are from you, the individual person, in order to satisfy the skills criteria for your particular occupation in that particular visa type. Um, like I said, some occupations will find sponsors more easily than others. This is because some skills are in very short supply here in Australia. Um, and this leads me on to my next point, And that is the fact that we currently have clients of ours who are employers here in Australia um, who are looking to sponsor people in these occupations. So construction project managers, um, we can't get enough of them at the moment here in Australia. Um, surveyors, civil engineering technicians, welders, auto electricians, diesel mechanics, mechanical fitters, air conditioning mechanics, motor mechanics. We could have a, a long list here of people, of clients that we have um, who are actively pursuing people in these particular occupations. Other occupations that are commonly sponsored, there's a lot of IT occupations. If you work in cyber security, um, if you're a data analyst of some description, an ICT business analyst, there's a lot of IT occupations which are in very high demand here in Australia at the moment. There's a lot of healthcare occupations in very high demand, nurses, doctors, other health um, professionals. Um, Jamie, you've had quite a few clients contact you directly from South Africa and from the United Kingdom who work in uh, health and IT, who have found their own employer sponsors, is that Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah, they'll come to you at first, um, say that they haven't found anybody, they don't really know how to go about it, give them a few suggestions like what we've just spoke about today, and they go away and they're coming back a few weeks later and they've managed to find employers and not to sound rude or anything they're not they're not uh, you know exceptional candidates it's not like they're holding phds and 20 years work experience and they've you know reinvented the yeah. wheel yeah going to cure cancer it's not like that they are general individuals that have just a yep. reasonable amount of work experience and they're qualified mm. and they're finding sponsors yep. it's it's an effect of the COVID pandemic australia having their borders closed for so long um employer sponsored yep. visas get people in and get them in quickly so yep. it's a good option yeah it's a good time to be looking for an employer to sponsor you here in Australia at the moment because the pandemic has left us with a really big shortage in the skills and labour that we need here in Australia to do what needs to be done. Our borders were closed for a long time. A lot of temporary residents left Australia. Um, so, yeah, the opportunity at the moment um, to find yourself an employer sponsor uh, is good. Um, be flexible. Be prepared to work in a regional area. Like we, we've already touched on regional areas are, are not the end of the earth. Um, you, you, you might even be more uh, likely to find a sponsor in your particular occupation when you look in the regional areas. Some of the largest employers happen to be in the metropolitan and city areas. However, some of the employers who have the greatest skill shortages happen to be in the regional areas. Um, so don't cut yourself off just because you know someone in Sydney um, and you've been there and you, and you like the harbour doesn't mean that that's where you're going to find your job or that's where you're going to find your employer. So, you know, be willing to look elsewhere outside of those metropolitan areas. Um, and then finally, 
Um, my next set of advice would be to have a strategy. Perhaps for some, it might be possible to come to Australia on a temporary visa and find employment. And we see this common on people who come to Australia on student visas um, or even on working holiday visas. Uh, so if you have an eligible passport, like a British passport or an Irish passport, it's possible for you to come here on a working holiday visa. And what we find typically is then you, you get to Australia, you're onshore, you have work rights, you find an employer, you work for them for a period of time, you prove yourself, and then they don't want to let you go. And then they're willing to go through the sponsorship process for you all too easily. The student visa option is a good one for those who are willing to study. Perhaps you've done a bachelor's degree back home. Perhaps you've got a couple of years of experience. You're considering doing a master's degree. If you came to Australia and studied a master's degree, you get a post-study work visa for two or more years. And then you have independent work rights here in Australia. Um, and we see a lot of people then be sponsored after completing a, a master's degree or a bachelor's degree and then getting post-study work rights here in Australia. Um, and then my final point is if you find an employer who is interested but they're confused, they don't understand the process um, and they want some further information, please get in touch with us. I'm happy to call the employer here in Australia and talk them through it, answer all their questions um, and then hopefully after I have that conversation with the prospective employer, I can demystify the, the process, I can make it more simple for them uh, and in doing so, they're more open to the idea um, of going through this process of sponsorship. Jamie, we've got a question there. Yes, I can see um, we've got a question about the chances of getting an employer-sponsored visa without a degree. Um, it would depend on your occupation. So that's definitely something that we can look into for you. Um, I believe we actually have this individual's email address, so I'm more than happy to reach out. It's an interesting point um, and it does take individual assessment of an individual person, their occupation and what the nominated occupation will be. And I'll give you an example. A construction project manager does not need to have a degree. If they don't have a formal qualification in project managing of, um, of buildings, then they would need at least five years of relevant work experience. So that's an occupation where you can substitute um, experience for formal qualifications. However, civil engineer, they say no, you must have the formal qualification. You must have a degree um, in civil engineering or something closely related plus two years of work experience. So it all comes down to individual circumstances, individual occupations uh, in order for us to determine whether or not you might be eligible. And it's part of the service that we provide. Um, we don't charge for that service. You're welcome to call Jamie send us an email. If you have a prospective employer and you want us to try and determine whether or not you're eligible or what you're eligible for, um, then we're happy to do that for you free of charge. And I can also see there's a question that's falling more towards, um, I believe it's skilled visas, probably what this individual's after, um, just about questions. If they get an employer to sponsor them, do they get extra points? And they've asked us to unpack it a bit. Um, unfortunately, that's a little bit outside of today's topic. Um, so we won't unpack this right now, but you are more than welcome to get in touch with us via email or um, via our contact number, which we'll share at the end. And um, you can get in contact today. I'm free the rest of the afternoon. So I'd be happy to speak with you about that. Um, that's our 40 minutes. And like I said at the start, I like, to, I like to wrap these things up in 40 minutes if possible. I've just put a link in the chat box um, as a business in South Africa, we run expos around the country um, at least once a year, um, sometimes two or three times a year. Um, and um, in the coming weeks, we are traveling all across the country. Uh, we're in Durban on the 27th and 28th uh, at the Oyster Box Hotel. Um, we are in Pretoria on the 31st of October at the Maslow Times Square. We're in Johannesburg at the Houghton Golf Club between the 1st and 3rd of November. And then finally, we're in Cape Town on the 7th and 9th of November at Kelvin Grove Club. Um, so if you're in those areas and you wish to see Jamie in person, um, then feel free to register, get along. Um, otherwise, uh, if you're not able to attend, feel free to send us an email, give us a call. Uh, there's our contact details on screen. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope we've been able to uh, enlighten you, to share some insights um, and, and most of all, uh, share our experience with you. 
um, and hopefully in the future we might hear from you when you've found an employer to sponsor you. Yeah, hopefully. Please get back in touch with us if you do. All right. Let's wrap this up. Thanks, Jamie. That's us for today, guys. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.